um, so that she successfully gets to the bottom and also doesn't die when she gets there, right? And we're kind of simplifying the world into a model, right? This is what we've been talking about for search. Okay, so we've discretized the locations on the mountain that Alice can be, right? And they take these values just from the top to the bottom and certain discretized points in between, right? Okay, we've also given Alice a set of possible actions she can take. Right? She can accelerate, she can decelerate, or she can coast. Right? Okay, so that means she has some velocity, right? And if we accelerate, we increment that velocity. If we decelerate, we de decrement that velocity. And if we coast, we leave velocity unchanged. <laughs> right? And then the world progresses, right? As a function of her velocity. Okay. Everybody with me so far? All right, great. So if she has velocity three at the end of the turn, then she moves downhill equal to that number of squares, right? So you update the velocity, then you move, that's an action, right? Okay, everybody with me so far? <laughs> Great, okay. So as I mentioned, we wanna plan through this, right? And so we need to construct some state representation of this have some notion of what our actions look like, how they operate on states, have some notion of goal test on a state, right, so that we can successfully plan using the planning algorithms that we've been planning on. Okay, so we've defined the goal for you, kind of. Alice's goal is to reach the bottom and have a velocity of zero at some point along the way. Okay? So you can't go back up the mountain. Um, she wants to get there as quickly as possible, but if she ends her turn, in the goal with a non-zero velocity, she's going to end up in the parking lot, um, and that's going to be bad times, right? Okay, so when we're just designing what our state space looks like here, as I mentioned in the past, we want to make it kind of as simple as possible, but such that it's still expressive enough that we can operate on it in the way we need to to do search, right? And so those operators are, for one, a goal test. We have to be able to take some state and say, is this state a goal? Or is it not? So that means your state space representation at least has to be able to answer that question. So we're going to kind of build the complexity of the state space as we think about this, right? Okay, so what do we need to know in order to answer the question, is a state the goal? Yes? Which square they're in? So we need to know which square, right? Some notion of square. And there's one more component that we need, right? Velocity. The velocity. Okay. Is this sufficient to answer the question, is this state a goal? If we know these two values for a given state, can we say yes, goal, or no? Okay, good. That's not the whole story, right? Because we have to be able to transfer between states, right? To evolve the world, to take actions, right? So we have to be able to say, from some state, given my set of actions, do I have enough information to know which state I end up in next, right? Is this sufficient to answer that question in this problem? Yeah, you know, you need the so you need to know the actions, but the actions are kind of existing as a separate set. We're talking about like the representation of the state. So would the, the action would modify the velocity, which would then change the, the resultant state that you transition into, right? Yes. What's that? So the actions would be transition between states. The actions <laughs> define transitions between states. Um, the transition here is kind of moving, but the action is how do you update your state such that you have a good definition <coughs> of the evolution of the states, right? So is this sufficient for that, for how we've defined the problem? It is, right? Okay, so this is a representation of the state space. You would need to know what the number of the square is, right, and what the value of the velocity is. Right? And some setting of those two values would be a state. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. I'm not saying this is the only way to represent this problem. This is a way to represent this problem. If you choose a different way to represent this problem, justify it. Okay? But basically what you want is if you want it to be as low dimensional as possible. And that word I think is causing some people some concern. So let's talk about it for a second. What I mean by dimensional, the dimensionality of your state space, is the number of numbers that you need to represent a state. 
Okay, so what would the dimensionality then of this state be? Two. It would be two, right? If Alice was operating kind of on a grid, where she can go left and right and down and she's trying to avoid dots, but also have this notion of velocity, what would a good state space dimensionality be in that case? Three. Might be three, right? Maybe you want to know the row, the column, and the velocity. Um, maybe you would want it to be four because you want to know the role, the column, the velocity in X, and the velocity in Y, potentially. Right? These are all kind of open questions. But that's what we mean by dimensionality. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so in this representation, dimensionality is two. Okay? That's not the cardinality of the state space, right? The cardinality of the state space would be the size of the set of possible states. Right? That's a different question. Right? Okay, so does this make sense? Dimensionality is what we're looking for. Uh, um, dimensionality is what we're looking for in this first question. If this is your state space representation, and you can justify it well, which you should be doing if this is what you choose, then your dimensionality would be two. So in this representation, what would the start state be? Square root of zero or square root of one with the value of zero or velocity of zero. Right. So let's say we index at zero, right? Uh, I'm erasing. Zero, one, two. So you need to justify this, right, by just describing how you're indexing potentially. But let's say that's how we do it, right? The start state would be square zero velocity equals Right? 
So I can then decelerate from here. Right, it's just kind of plants me into this position. Right? But I can also coast, right, which would put me here, or I can accelerate, which would put me here. Right? You all see what this is doing? Okay, so to answer question three, you could, as one strategy, look through this for some number, it's like some finite number of position velocities, and say, where can I get? And then look at the more restricted version of the problem and say, is this the same number? If we accelerate from say two comma two comma one, then we end up with this uh, end state for the first. Yeah. Oh yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So we'd actually end up here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yes. Uh, okay. Oh. <laughs> I swear I did not answer one. Okay. Great. Yes, you're right. Okay. So does that make sense to everybody? Yes. I, I kind of had the idea that if you decelerate it, I, I, now I'm thinking about it again, I understand, but I had the idea if you decelerate it too, you would be three with a velocity of zero. If you decelerate when? You're on, you're on two and you have velocity of one. And two and one, okay. I, I thought, for, yeah, two and one, I thought if you decelerate, you end up at three, zero. Just, I just kind of had the idea because the idea if you arrive at goal of one, you would ski into the parking lot. So you can be at goal with a velocity of one, and then act on your velocity okay. and enter the goal state. But the goal with a velocity of one is not the goal state. All right. Right? Where your position is g, your velocity right. is one. It's not the goal state. Mm -hmm. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a good point. Important decision. OK. Do you all feel good about this now? Great. OK. Yes. Uh, can we also go over what is considered a, a, an admissible heuristic? OK. So admissible heuristic. Who could define for me admissible heuristic here? So the, like the actual cost of the, the travel from start to goal, the admissible heuristic is above 0 and less than or equal to that. Yes. 0 or greater, so it's greater than or equal to 0. It's not strictly above 0. So it must be zero at the goal state to be admissible, but it can be zero elsewhere. Oh, okay. So admissibility implies it's zero at the goal state, right? Because what's the cost from the goal state to the goal state? Zero. So it's bounded both lower end by zero and upper by zero, right? Yeah. Um, but for other states, it has to be greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to the cost, which could be zero, right? So we talked about the trivial heuristic, right? Um, uniform cost search is a special example of ASAR wherein the heuristic is zero. Right. Yes? If you're at a state that you cannot reach the goal from, um, then the actual cost of getting to the goal would be infinity, or how would you define that? Probably that's a good representation. Yeah. And then any heuristic is below that. Any no, 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 greater than or equal to zero heuristic would be admissible from that situation. Yeah. But the heuristic is kind of applied to all states, right? It's okay. Admissibility applies admissibility. Yes. So, so correct me if I'm misunderstanding. So an admissible heuristic is something specifically above zero? So an admissible heuristic, so a heuristic is a value applied to all states, it's some function over states, mm -hmm. right? Wherein you say, I have a state here, return me a value. That's the heuristic value, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really a function. But an admissible heuristic is for all states returning something that is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to the true cost to get from that state to the goal. Okay. Yes? The cost here is because you want to get there as quickly as possible to the number of moves. The number of moves, yeah. Okay, so then we might as well just keep going. So, does velocity seem like an admissible heuristic? So, remember that we talked about a, a, a strategy for finding good heuristics, and that's to expand your state space, right? Or your, your set of actions, I mean, to make a super set of possible actions. Um, so this may or may not be an instance of that, but kind of reason for it yourself. Sound good? Okay, we feel good? Great. Feel free to light up the discussion boards on campus. Um, other people can help. I encourage you to help each other, reason through these things, and we'll also be monitoring them. Great. Okay. Hold up. Do not disturb us now. Okay. <laughs> Clarification.
applications from last time. So we wrapped up um, CFPs. Does everybody feel good about CFPs? Great. There were a few questions from last time that I said I'd clarify this time. I'm going to once again punt to next time, but we'll get those. Okay. So that's how it'll go sometimes, but I promise I will do my best to at some point address them. Great. Okay. So let's talk about game playing because this is where we start to get to how to play a game that's not just by yourself. Right? Okay, so let's start about talk about the state of the art in AI and game playing. Okay, so checkers. Everybody's familiar with checkers? In 1950-ish, they had the first computer player. It was okay. We saw that in the first lecture. Um, it was that big array of flashing lights and maybe some tape coming in and out, probably I'm sure. Maybe noises, I'm not sure. But first checkers player. In 1994, we had the first computer champion that ended the 40 year reign of a human champion. It's got to be a bummer for that person. 40 years, right? But anyway, uh, at that point, we say checkers is an expert, right? It is the best. Some, some AI system is the best in the world at playing checkers compared to all humans, which is probably all of their experts, right? Okay, in 2007, however, we said checkers is solved. Can anybody tell me what we mean by solved? Yes. It's regardless of, it, like, even facing itself, it's either a stalemate or a complete success. Yes. So in 2007, the AI world proved that they know the exact sequence of actions that would either win a checkers every time or draw a checkers, depending on which side you start on first. Solved. Right? Can't be me. Okay, that's what we mean by solved. Checkers, solved. Chess. We talked about this a little bit, right? 1997, Deep Blue beat Kasparov. And it did so by examining 200 million potential positions per, per second using really, really sophisticated and undisclosed, thanks, IBM, methods um, for searching up to 40 fly, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Current programs are much, much better. It's less here, uh, sort of, right? Okay. Not solved, though. We don't really know whether you can guarantee a win or not. A lot of people suspect that you can guarantee a draw, but it's happening to prove. Okay, not solved. Go. 10-ish or greater than 10 years ago, the top Go players in the world wouldn't even play Go AI systems. It was insulting. They were so bad, right? <clears throat> However, a few years ago, human champions started to be challenged by these machines, right? So the branching factor in Go is roughly 300 on average. Humongous branching factor, that's what makes it so difficult. Um, classic programs were using a lot of kind of built-in heuristic knowledge on various patterns, um, but they also looked at uh, kind of Monte Carlo randomized search methods it would say, given some kind of random moves, which position looks better, who's in a better spot, etc. Et All right, this was a few years ago. We would say, go, not really expert, right? But can play a decent game. But then, in 2016, something really historic happened. We've talked about this a little bit. But AlphaGo defeated the human champion in 2016. And it used something called Monte Carlo Tree Search, which we'll touch on a little bit near the end of the semester. Um, and a learned evaluation function, which at the end of this lecture you'll be able to tell me what that means. And then came AlphaGo Zero. Does anybody know the difference between AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero? Yes. Does AlphaGo Zero allow to play itself? So AlphaGo looked at a big repository from corpus of expert human games <laughs> and it was training itself. Right? Um, and so we could say yes. AI may have beat humans at Go, but we kind of taught it how to do it, right? Like it had to learn from the best humans in order to do that. AlphaGo Zero did not use any human games at all. It just started playing itself, got better and better and better, um, and then beat AlphaGo. Um, an AlphaGo that was trained in three days, I think. But anyway, the point is, now we can't even say like, hey, we used our training data. So it's kind of fun. Does anybody play Go? Fellow, fellow. Huh? Othello. It's not Othello, although the colors look similar on the board. Um, anyway, you should try to get this All right. The 
question we've all been waiting for. What about Pac-Man? <laughs> right? Well, let's see. Maybe. All right. So up to now, we've talked about ways for Pac-Man to kind of move around the board, uh, find pathing through the board to get from one spot to another, maybe find ways to smartly and efficiently eat all of the pellets that's trying to eat, right? We haven't really talked about ghosts. Right, so in Pac-Man, the ghosts are trying to get you. Um, you die if the ghosts touch you. You can eat these power pellets, the bigger pellets, right? And then the ghosts start blinking blue and <coughs> white, and they start running away from you, and then you can eat them and get like positive score from doing so, and they respawn in the middle, right? This is how Pac-Man works. So today we're going to start talking about, well, what about the ghosts? Okay, so this is like Revenge of the Ghosts lecture. All right, so let's look at how a Pac-Man agent might work when it's considering ghosts. And... Uh, by the end of this week, you should have the knowledge from the lectures, at least, to understand maybe how this is working. Okay, so let's see what it is. So this is much more sophisticated, or at least the behavior is a lot more sophisticated than just trying to eat pellets, right? It knows that it needs to run from ghosts when they get too close, like you just saw. It may be reasoning, depending on the level of sophistication, about when it needs to eat these power pellets in order to eat the ghosts. Right? Oh, look, my leg. Right, this seems pretty sophisticated for an automated system. Right? Well, well, it's almost very interactive. So the ghosts have some strategy that we haven't defined yet, but Pac-Man may have some knowledge of it or may not, <coughs> depending. Either way, regardless of the behavior of the ghosts, we don't really have the machinery based on what we talked about up until this class, right, to, uh, oh, we'll do it twice, uh, to really be able to solve this problem effectively, right? None of our previous algorithms would be able to solve it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. All right, and the way we're going to do this, we're going to talk about adversarial games. Okay. So what are the types of games, just games in general? There's a bunch, right? So what are some of the qualities that we can start classifying these by? Um, we'll call these axes, right? So maybe they're deterministic or they're stochastic. So what's an example of a deterministic game? Sure, yeah, depending on your formalization. Um, if you're rolling dice, you're pulling cards from a pile. Those might be stochastic, right? You don't know the state of Or you don't know how things are going to there might be one, two, or more players, right? What about zero sum? Has anybody heard this concept before? We'll talk about it in a little more detail here in a second. Perfect information. Can you see the state or not? What about go? We have perfect information about go. Yes. What's an example of a game where you don't have perfect information? Strategic. Strategic. Yeah, right. These are these things with like fog of war, right? Is what they call it, maybe. I was a terrible League of Legends player for like three minutes. Yeah. 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 Wow, you took three minutes. Basically three <laughs> minutes, yeah. And then they were like yelled at me, and then all the teenagers were really mean, and I quit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but there's this notion of fog of war, right, where you don't really know where things are. You can't see the whole state of the board. What's another example? Maybe in like a card game. Yes. Poker. Poker. Yes. So you don't know what cards the other players have. Right. You don't have full information. Okay, so we want our algorithms to calculate a strategy, which we're going to formally call a policy, which rec recommends a move from each state. So this policy, this is an important concept. So we'll formally define it here in a second. But we're going to talk about deterministic games for now. Okay, so as many formalizations possible, but let's start with this. So we'll have some set of states. This is going to look pretty familiar, right? The start state may be S0. We have some number of players. Usually they take turns. For today, we're going to consider them taking turns sequentially. Okay. We have some set of actions. That may be specific to a player. It may be specific to a state. Right? You may have restricted actions depending on your state. There's going to be some transition function. We've seen this before, right? We take a state and an action. We arrive at a state. Right? We need some terminal test. Is this game over? Right? And here's something new. We need a terminal utility. So given a terminal state, 
What's the outcome? Did I win? Did I lose? Did I draw? Did I win by some amount? Did I lose by some other amount? Did I draw? Just kind of stuff, right? Okay. And then a solution from our perspective for a player is a policy that maps every state to an action. So given a state, I know exactly what to do. Right? We're trying to develop something that provides that policy monkey for us. Right? Okay. All right. So this concept of zero sum games. Basically, the idea is that agents in these games have opposite utilities. So there's some single value, some single resource that everybody's trying to get, and you want it. And if you take it, they can't have it. Right? So there's some single value where you can say everybody's trying to maximize this value, or you're maximizing this value, and they're minimizing this value. It's something like this, right? Okay. It's adversarial, pure competition. There's also general games, right? They may be different utilities. Um, there may be cooper cooperation, indifference, competition, uh, right? The world of games is big. There's a lot of, lot of games. All right. We're going to talk about zero sum games today. Basically, what we're going to talk about is adversarial search. So we're going to kind of frame the playing of a game in a similar framework to what we've talked about so far. But the idea is that you're going to reason, as an agent, about what the other agent is going to do. And they're reasoning about what you're going to do. And you're reasoning about what they're going to do. And you're reasoning about what they're reasoning about what you're going to do. <laughs> right? And then they're reasoning about what you're reasoning about what they're going to reason about what you're I, I got lost. But you see what I'm saying? Right? OK. So before we talk about that, let's refresh ourselves on how game playing may work for a single agent in this kind of free form of game. Okay, so we have some start state, right? We have a set of possible actions. For Pac-Man here, that's go left or go right. It's restricted by this maze, right? You can't go up through the wall or down, right? So we're going left or right. Okay. From there, we can go left or we can go right, each, right? And so we see this tree being built. This rightmost state here, that's a terminal state, right? The game's over. All the pellets have been eaten. These ones, however, there's going to be more, right? There's more actions available, subtrees, those kind of things. OK, let's say that this has a value of 8. So in Pac-Man, you get 10 points. And how we do it, at least, you get 10 points for eating a pellet. You lose 1 point per turn. You lose 500 points if you get eaten by a ghost. You get 500 points if you get all the pellets. Just, let's ignore the 500 points for now. But basically, it took us two actions to eat this pellet. So this state has some value of 8. Right? Does that make sense? These ones down the trees may have other different kinds of values. Basically, what we're going to try to do is maximize the value. OK. So we need to start talking about what a value of a state is. So it's pretty obvious what a value of a terminal state is. Right? That's just the value of the state. So that would be 8 here. Right? But what's the value of a non-terminal state, one that has children? Well, we're trying to maximize our utility, right? We talked about that in the first class. We call this class maximizing utility. With this, right? So maybe we say the value of a state is going to be the maximum of the value of its children, right? So that's the maximum terminal value that you can achieve given that you exist in this state right now. Does that make sense? All right, so here that may be, let's see, the value of this would be the maximum of this, right? And six. This one's 8, so the value here would be 8, right? 2, 6, 6, 8. Right? Does everybody see that? If you're in the start state, given these values we've defined here, ignoring the ones we haven't, that are the dot dot dots, right? Then the value of this root node here is 8. That's the best you can achieve from this. Does that make sense? Okay. The value of a state is the best achievable outcome from that state. Mm. Yes, so this is just <laughs> saying exactly what we said. In terminal states, it's exactly the value. Um, in non-terminal states, it's the max of the children. Right? Okay. What about adversarial game trees? Okay, so here we have a ghost. Right? So Pac-Man gets to choose some action. <coughs> go left or go right. What happens now? Well, now the ghost gets to the main. Right? So the ghost gets to go left or right from this state. Right? It's also true over here. And then Pac-Man gets to move. Right? And so we can conceptualize this tree exactly the same, except for now we have these intermediate layers, right? Where Pac-Man's moving and the ghost's moving, and Pac-Man's moving and the ghost's moving. We still have outcomes, right? 
Okay, so let's go through an example. The utility now of some node is going to be slightly different. It's still going to be the maximum utility that you can achieve from there, but it's going to take into consideration the behavior of the other agent. Okay, so let's say we start here. You can go left or you can go right, and then the ghost chooses. But we're going to assume that the ghost is operating optimally. Okay? So, what would you want to do in this set? Well, this looks like the juiciest state, right? We would want to end up in that state. But that state's not possible. So why is that state not possible? Because here, the ghost gets to choose, right? And the ghost is going to look at which of these do I want to happen. The ghost wants you to lose, right? So the ghost is going to force you, if you're in this state, to go down this way. Does that make sense? Okay, so then what happens if we go over here? Which does the ghost choose? The worst of these, right? The ghost is trying to beat you. It wants to minimize your effort, right? So it's going to choose this one. Okay, so then at these nodes, the utility is going to be not the maximum, but the minimum of the utility of the children, right? Does everybody see that? Okay. So the ghost says, this value here is actually negative 10, this value here is actually negative 8, and then you can say, uh, which do I want, negative 10 or negative 8? Negative 8 would be the right choice for me. And so this game then is going to follow the progression. Pac-Man chooses to go this way, the ghost says, well, given that, the worst outcome for you is this way, and you end up in that state at the bottom left. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, if we were strategizing from the perspective of the ghost, the uh, plus and minuses would all be flipped? Is that it might be flipped, or you're just trying to achieve a lower value, it depends on how you look at it. There's the one. Okay, everybody with me so far? All right. So the states that are under, more formally, the states that are under your opponent's control, their value is the minimum of their successors' value, right? Whereas the states that are under your control are the maximum of uh, the values of that state's successors. Okay, so this is going to be implemented recursively, and you can probably see it here in a minute. Uh, but this is how it's going to work. Searching with this kind of reasoning is called mini-max search. Okay. So, let's think about tic-tac-toe, maybe. This is pretty simple, right? You see the good guy is blue, the bad guy is red. So the red person, the red go, ah, robot takes the first move, right, those are the possible states. Each of those has some child, right, that's the max. Max is turn, right, they place a no. Or an X, yeah, no, right, and on and on and on. Right, you can see how this works. Okay, so minimax search here is our first example of adversarial search. It is for deterministic zero-sum games. So this can work on things like tic-tac-toe, chess, checkers, so one player is maximizing the result, the other is minimizing the result, or maximizing some inverse problem, right? Kind of a mark. Okay, and in minimax search, you have your state space search tree, very similar to what we've talked about in the past. Uh, players are alternating turns that corresponds to the layers of the screen, right? And you're gonna compute each node's minimax value, which is the best achievable utility against a rational or optimal adversary. Okay. So, as I mentioned, um, you need some notion of terminal values here, right? Because you have to get to these to start reasoning about the values of states above. Okay, so we're going to do this recursively. So, who's seen mutual recursion? Has anybody seen mutual recursion? Okay, so this is the type of recursion where you have two functions that are kind of alternating. A lot of people will throw out a bad example of saying, is this integer even or odd, using this kind of thing. Um, but the idea is that this function is calling this function recursively, calling this function recursively, etc. Right? Um, this is one way that you can implement any kind of search. There's a problem here that we don't have a base case, so this isn't really going to work. It'll be a base case for this kind of concept. Right? Um, where in one, you're computing the max of the successors, and the next step is computing the minimum of the successors each time you're passing these values back up. Right? Um, so another way to do this that does have base cases <coughs> would be to have some dispatch function. 
uh, that's where each one is calling this on its successors and it's choosing which of these recursive functions to call based on which state or layer of the tree you're talking about. Yes. So I don't know, we're probably going to talk about this, but this clearly doesn't work for like continuous pairing or non existent pairing in a game. Of course, this is other HM based recursion code. Mm -hmm. um, how would you, I guess, with a continuous component reduce, trying to figure out if your current state will result in like a negative outcome, basically, and you continuously do these tests, or is it similar to just sort of turn based? So we'll talk later in the semester about kind of what you do when it's not turn based anymore. But um, you can kind of think of, you can kind of cast continuous turns into uh, turn based frameworks where you have an option that is do nothing, for instance, um, and then do exact things after that. And it, it gets kind of complicated. That's not the problem that I'm going to do it. We'll talk about that later. But um, you can kind of see where we go with it. Okay. So let's do an example. Let's take five minutes break, and then we'll do an example of how this works. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
so if you ever want to see the let's talk about it. I mean, I'm about to answer this question, so, like, answer the question, so I'll just answer it. No, you can go ahead. That's like the only thing that's like, I, I still am not getting it. I struggle with the concept of disability from um, We'll talk about your class in a second, and then we can definitely come to office hours and talk about this for you. Absolutely. You, you have office hours after this, no? On Fridays. On Fridays. From free love. But also the TAs have Wouldn't that be more likely to choose just to post 
see your heuristic is maybe not guiding you in the correct direction from the start state. But is it a discipline? How many steps is it going to take you to get from the start to the goal? At least zero. Perfect. So it's a missed goal from that perspective. But yeah, that's a very good insight. Okay, we feel good here? Awesome. Okay, so let's talk about uh, minimaps. We'll go through an example. Okay, so in these examples, these are max of the children. These are min of the children. You can think of it as like taking the big value here, taking the little value here. Does that make sense? That's just how we're drawn. Okay. So let's say you start here. You have some set of possible actions. Let's say that it's three. Which are you going to take? We don't know. Right? So we'll do some search. Right? So let's look at the leftmost action for a second. And now our opponent gets to choose. Right? So let's say that there's three possible choices there. Which one is the opponent going to choose? We still don't know. Right? We have to find some terminal nodes. So let's look. Okay. So we're going to talk about, we're going to reason over how a node's specific value evolves over time <coughs> in the search. Right? So we evaluate this min's node's leftmost child, and we find a value of three. Right? So the value of this node is exactly three. So then we're going to take the min, right? This, this node here takes the minimum value. So for now, that value is 3. But we know that at the end of the day, the value is going to be less than or equal to 3. Right? That will be important later. But for now, it's 3. OK. Now we keep looking. It's 12. Did that change our value? It's not. We know it's 8. Does that change our value? Do we need to keep looking? If there are more children, do we need to keep looking? Right? It might be negative infinity next. We want to know that. So we're going to take another value. Right? But let's say this is all the children. Then we know for sure this value now is exactly 3. Right? So now we have a guess for what the value here is. Right? We're going to take the max. So we know that for now it's 3. But it's at least 3. Right? Does that make sense? That will be important later. OK. So then we keep looking. Right? So this one has these terminal children. What's its value? Yep. Did that change our value here? No. We're going for max. We're going for max, right? Good. OK, so let's look at this one. Value is equal to 14 for now, but what is it now? Two. Two. Um, did that change our original value? No. no. So at the end of the day, value is 3. My handwriting is awful on this thing. I apologize. I'll, I'll crack this one. But, okay. Right? So now we know the value for each of these nodes, right? So we've solved this here. So what will happen is over the course of the game, agent one will take us this way, right? Then agent two will take us this way. And that's how the game will play. Okay. Minimax is optimal <laughs> against a player that's playing optimally. What about if the player's not playing optimally? Uh, ah. Yeah, then we have a probabilistic situation, right? Um, so let's look at this example here. What's the value of the max node at the top? Uh, Everybody see that? You really want this one, but you can't get there. Because if the min player is playing optimally, it will never allow you to do so. But what if instead of playing this guy, you actually playing this guy? <laughs> it's a little goofier. Maybe it doesn't look as good as it gets up. Right? Well, maybe you want to take your chances down that right branch. Right? Because nine's not that much worse than ten. But if they mess up there, then you end up with a hundred, and that's much better. Right? So then we'd have to start thinking about, you know, what's the probability that they will choose one branch versus another there, um, and then maybe, you know, there's some machinery and stats that we can start talking about, like what kind of values we can expect to see at various times, right? We'll get into that um, later, but it's worth thinking about, right? 
So let's see um, what's going to change with Pac-Man when we talk about playing Minimax exactly, whereas some expected value version. Right? So let's talk about the scoring system here. OK, I mentioned this earlier, but we get 10 for eating a dot. You get minus 1 every time you take an action. You get minus 500 if you're eating, you get plus 500 for winning by eating all the dots. You have to take an action, it's not like you cannot take an action. So, in this setting, which is a real big bummer for Pac Man, <laughs> what's the optimal solution here? <laughs> Can't stay still. Yes? Yeah, it's to dive bar on the orange ghost, right? Because you can do it fast. You're going to lose. Right? The blue ghost is going to come and get you. The orange ghost is going to come and get you too. So you either lose with in one turn or you lose in two or three. Right? So the score you're going to get if you lose in one turn is higher strictly than the score you get if you lose in two or three. So Minimax will tell you dive bottom the ghost. Yes? If you die and you lose on a certain point, let's say the game's over, that's it. Right. All right, so let's test this hypothesis. So here we have optimal Pac-Man playing Mini Max. Uh, that's uh, Pac-Man not playing optimally. Let's see, I may have messed up our videos. OK, I did mess up the videos. I apologize. The answer is to dive on the ghost if you're playing optimally in Mini Max. Okay. But stop. Uh, OK. But let's say that this ghost here on the left is either going to go up or it's going to go down with equal probability, right? Then all of the computation changes, right? The optimal solution is to say, I'm going to take my chances that that ghost is going to go down. Because if that ghost goes down, I know it's going to keep going down, because that's the behavior we decoded in the ghost, is that if they're not at an intersection, they're going to keep going in that direction. Then I'm going to get to win, right? And so. The slightly worse cost of negative 502 instead of negative 501 is worth the risk under the assumption that 50% of the time I'm actually going to win with a positive cost of like 534 or something like that. Right? So that's what Pac Man does here. Gets lucky this time, the ghost is going down. You keep going. Okay, so we'll talk about formalizing that concept um, where you have uncertainty in the behavior of the, of the agents in the next class. Um, but for now, let's keep talking about Minimax. How efficient is Minimax? In the worst case, it's going to look like an exhausted DFS. You have to consider every possible leak code, right, at the end of the day. Um, so what is that? Just like DFS, right? The problem is that these B's and these M's can get really, really big, right? So the reason that you couldn't just implement Minimax and beat Kasparov at chess is because you didn't have time or the resources to compute all the possible outcomes of chess, which has fewer possible outcomes at any given time than Go, which is why Go took longer, right? But that's not how it would. I mean, Deep Blue didn't compute all the possible outcomes of chess. That can't be done, right? So the exact solution is completely infeasible. But do we have to explore the whole tree? Really? I kind of hinted at this a little bit ago, didn't I? Since we're maximizing things and minimizing things, we actually have some knowledge over things that are not going to change our outcome, depending on how they work out exactly. Right? Um, so if we have limited resources, we can start doing <coughs> things like pruning of the tree. So we've been doing pruning of search already. Like in CSPs, when we said this node has zero domain values available to it, so I'm just going to stop, right? This is an unsolvable problem. That's a, a version of pruning. So how do we prune in Minimax search? OK, so if we look at this example again, here, yeah, B is roughly 3, B is roughly 3 here, right? Do we need to explore this child here? We do, for sure, 
right? Because if it's less than three, that's going to matter to everybody, right? Um, in fact, let's. That's going to be true for this nodes, all of this nodes children, right? But at some point we say this is equal to three, right? And so now we have some information that we can pass back up, and we know that this value is going to be greater than or equal to three, right? Okay, so let's keep going. So now we have this value of two. What happens now? Child to provide you with the value and always take the first 
shot, but that's the old one. If you get uh, notes that are high. Okay. So one thing that's important to think about is the good ordering of the numbers in which you ex the order in which you expand your children um, can provide varying degrees of efficacy for your pruning. So if you're smart about how you expand children, your pruning is going to be a lot more efficient. Um, when we start talking about learned function values, when we're estimating, um, in the case where trees are too deep, this becomes really important. Yes? What do you mean by um, uh, children of the root may have the wrong value? Okay, so let's go through this example here. I think this will explain it. Um, I probably should have done this. Okay, so in Max's case, we look left, right? This node here minimizes its one child, so he is equal to 10, right? So then we go down the other side, move the child B here is less than or equal to 10. In the naive implementation of Minimax, we prune this, right? Because we know that regardless, Max can always go this way and get something at least as good as 10, right? But the true value here is zero, right? So the value of the children is wrong if you don't look to that. So then you have B equals 10 and B equals 10, right? So to expand on this, what we've determined from alpha beta pruning is that B here is roughly 10, or <coughs> exactly equal to 10, B here is roughly 10. If we were to choose you know, some tie-breaking mechanism to go this way, well, now we're in trouble, right? Because min's going to send us down to zero. And now we have scored zero, where we could have had a score of 10 if we had actually known the real value. You see what I'm saying? So it comes up when there's ties to be broken. Um, I mentioned just a second ago about keeping track of which is the first child to provide you with the value. So in this case, there's two children providing you with the value of 10, an approximate value of 10. <coughs> Keep track of which one was the first one, I think the first one. That would have been different. Nice. There's other ways to do it. Okay, so if you have perfect ordering, um, which we'll define another time, you can get time complexity down to B of M over 2, which functionally doubles the depth that you can look in the same amount of computation. <coughs> okay, but fully searching out something like chess or Go is still possible. So we need different strategies for those. Um, this is a simple example of meta reasoning which is where you do some computation or some reasoning about what next to compute or reason over. Does that make sense? Have you seen other examples of this? Okay, let's do a brief quiz here. Who can tell me what the value will be? Actually, who can tell me what'll be proof? What'll be proof? What'll be proof? Because we're searching. Just that? So let's look through. Okay, so we go down this way, we go down this way, we say this is less than equal to 10, right? But we can't stop, so we can't print this one, so then we say B is equal to 8 exactly, right? We pass up 8 here, B is greater than or equal to 8, right? We go down this way. What's this? We don't know. We look left, we say B is less than or equal to 4, and at this point, we can stop because anything's going to be worse than the 8 you can go in the other direction, right? And so we can turn that. Exactly. Oh, no. Why don't we take four of our remaining 10 minutes and feel free to discuss among yourselves. And let's tell me which of these edges can be proven in this example.
is that we get to drink. Yeah. B, G, N, and I think that's L. G, N, and L. Too many dudes. What did you have to do? Let's flip. Okay, so let's work through it. All right, so we come down this way, we come down this way, we come down this way. Um, so we're maximizing here, right? So this value is, after evaluating this node, greater than or equal to 10, do we need to keep looking? Yes. Yes, okay. We see six, nope, we're good. This is 10, right? Now we have some knowledge here. So we know here that the value is gonna be less than or equal to 10, right? Okay, so do we need to look at E? Yeah, we do. Go down this way. Um, do we need to look at F? Yes, we do. Okay, so this value is greater than or equal to 100 now, right? We need to look at G. Why not? Could be bigger than 100. What happens if it's bigger than 100? It doesn't matter because it needs to be less than. If it's greater than 100, if it's 1,000, it's 2,000, it's 100 million, that would be 10 4. It doesn't matter because the minimizer knows it's going to take us down to 10 more. Right? Okay. So this is proven G. All right. So do we need to go down H? Yeah. We do. Right, because we could find something. Well, now we have a value here, right? This is at least 10, right? Okay, so go down H, do we need to go down I? Do we need to go down J? The maximizing node, so it's at least one. Do we need to go down K? Okay, so now we know this is two, right? So we know this is less than or equal to two, right? Brings us to L. We need to go down L. Well, you do have to check M first. So. says you do not. All right, let's think about it. Okay, so we know that this is going to pass up something that's less than or equal to 2, right? So this value can only go down. But this node here can guarantee at least a 10 on the other side, right? <coughs> So what are the possible outcomes for L? Let's say we pass up something that's much less than two. Let's say it's like negative 316.4, right? Okay, so this one becomes negative 316.4 and it gets passed up. And then what does our top node do? Yeah, it's gonna go to 10. Okay, so what are the other options? It could be exactly two, let's pretend that's not the case, but it could be really big, right? Let's say it's positive 316.2. Then this is a minimizer node, right? So it's going to give us the two value, right? Pass that two up, and what's the top node going to do? Take the ten. Doesn't matter, right? So we can prune out as well. Since we pruned L, we don't need to prune N. Prune N. N was pruned kind of by construction, right? Uh, implicitly pruned. So does everybody see how this works? Okay. Um, this can be tough to build intuition on and to get your head around um, how these things are working, uh, what the patch to the root means from a various node that's in the pseudocode. Um, spend time with this. Once you get the intuition, it's, it's really nice, but it, it may take uh, people a minute to, to build that intuition. It certainly took me a while to build the intuition.